Welcome to live stream. It is a Friday. We are coming to you from the Huckabee Theater just outside of Nashville, Tennessee. We're going to be taping a show tonight, and uh, you'll get to see television this weekend on TBN, which I hope you already have it set. If you don't watch it live, you can always, of course, DVR it. You can see it on Facebook Live. You can watch it anytime you want to online. Go to Huckabee.tv. You'll see it there. But we like for people to watch it live, to respond immediately and give comments, which is exactly what we do here. Uh, over the next few minutes, we're going to be showing you some video clips of great news stories of the week. We will have a whole lot of things that we will ask you to join with us in. Johnny Livesay is with me today. He is uh, going to be fielding some of the questions that you send in, and we hope you'll start sending them in right now. If you like more visibility, send the super chat. We'll be able to move it to the top. We got moderators who watch the chat for the questions. They send them to us. We'll get to quite a few as we can. Well, today we're going to be talking about Biden, who continues to highlight just how terrible Bidenomics is, well, and how it's working for the American people, which the answer is not very well. Donald Trump's criminal trial hangs in the balance in Georgia as prosecutors Fannie Willis and her alleged lover testify. To be blunt, it hasn't gone well. And Democrats have found yet another way to get people to work for them without pay. I'll say what that's called, but I won't do it because YouTube would ban me for life just for saying it. You'll just have to wait and see what I'm talking about. We'll show you later in this edition of Livestream. One of the things we like to do, because some of you get here early, which we think is great, so we invite you to take a little poll prior to the show. That's our pre-show poll. Johnny, what do we have this week? All right. Well, we got a got a fun one, a little bit of a challenging one, and maybe a trick question. Um, the question is, which would you prefer Biden try to solve next? Uh, a, his vacation schedule. B, Bidenomics. C, his descent into madness. Or D, Kamala's laugh. Hmm. Well, the most difficult of those would be Kamala's laugh. But I don't know. What did our audience say? All right. Well, the top choice was his descent into madness hmm. uh, with 35%. Okay. His vacation schedule with 18, Bidenomics with 21%, and Kamala's laugh with 25%. Now, so, the hmm. the, uh, the trick question part of this is anything Biden tries to solve, he's just going to make worse. So, Well, that's a good point. Yeah. That That's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because he's done such a great job with our overseas relationships, with the border, with the economy, um, and with bringing the country together, which he said that was what not only he would do, but what only and only he could do. Never seen us this divided, ever. And a lot of it is because every day he goes out and makes a speech, he insults half of America, calling us uh, something horrible, threat to democracy, and worse. Our top comment from our last live stream comes from R.W. Colvin, who said, we need to look into the vacation package for the president. 17 weeks seems a little excessive. Yeah, I think it would be for most of us, R.W., but here's the problem. You see, Joe Biden's been on the public dole getting a taxpayer-funded paycheck since like the early 1970s, over 50 years. So, you know, in longevity, with employment, you tend to get additional vacation for how long you've been there. At this point, as long as he's been uh, taking a paycheck from the taxpayers, it's a miracle uh, that he has more than one or two weeks a year that he has to show up for work. It looks like the rest of it could be paid vacation, courtesy of the government. We also like to have a question for you this week, and here it is. Has the Fannie Willis drama given you hope that there might be real justice in Georgia. What do you think? Leave your answers in the chat or the comments section below. We'd love to hear from you starting right now. Let us know what you think. If you haven't already, we need you to hit that subscribe button. I said we didn't want you to. We need you to. And it's good for you, too. Hit that subscribe button right now and the notification bell. Hit the like button and the share. Let other people know that we're on live right now with the live stream. Now, the reason all that's important is because for us to be able to, uh, to present content like this to you, especially uh, uh, so that it's fresh and meaningful, we need to make sure that there's somebody out there. The only way that happens is for you to subscribe, and that is a great encouragement to us. So I hope you'll do it. We're going to get into uh, a little review of the Super Bowl. What a game. Oh, my gosh. 
Uh, pretty exciting ball game. Kansas City wins in overtime with a touchdown pass that uh, obviously the 49ers did not see coming. It was football as it should be. It was a Super Bowl as it should be with drama up until the very last second in which that touchdown pass was caught. Um, you're, you'll hear me say this, but I, I just want to reemphasize. I say you'll hear me say it in the monologue this weekend, but these were two great teams and they were quarterbacked by two exceptional young men, both of whom have nothing to be ashamed of. Obviously, Mahomes doesn't, he won. But the entire 49er team can hold their heads high. They played a phenomenal game, uh, didn't come out at the end like they wanted, but they had nothing uh, to be despondent over, although I know it's hard not to be despondent when you lose a Super Bowl uh, in such a close, close game. But, you know, the real loser of the Super Bowl may have been Joe Biden. Well, he wasn't playing. In fact, he didn't even do the traditional presidential halftime interview. No, because I think his staff were scared to death that he couldn't handle an interview in which questions were asked and he was expected to answer with cognitive answers that people would understand. So instead, he recorded this little, I guess it's a commercial. Um, it's, it's pretty bizarre. I want you to watch it, and then we'll tell you why we were left scratching our heads. Watch. The Super Bowl Sunday. If you're anything like me, you like to be surrounded by a snack or two while watching the big game. You know, when buying snacks for the game, you might have noticed one thing. Sports drinks bottles are smaller. A bag of chips has fewer chips, but they're still charging it just as much. And as an ice cream lover, what makes me the most angry is that ice cream cartons have actually shrunk in size, but not in price. I've had enough of what they call shrinkflation. It's a ripoff. Some companies are trying to pull a fast one by shrinking the products little by little and hoping you won't notice. Give me a break. The American public is tired of being played for suckers. I'm calling on companies to put a stop to this. Let's make sure businesses do the right thing now. Now, the obvious response is, what the heck does the President of the United States have to do with what size ice cream carton we're sold? And he says, we don't want to be suckers. We're suckers if, you, and if anyone voted for you. I, I'm just astonished that this was ever put together and somebody on his staff thought this was a good idea. Hey, if we're struggling with inflation, yeah, let's go out and blame the food companies. Let's don't say that Joe Biden's economic policies drove inflation because they did. Let's not talk about how that everything is costing more under Joe Biden not solely, but largely because of his attack on the energy industry, because when you attack energy and make it more expensive, it's not just the gasoline in your car. It's the gasoline in the truck that brought the bread to the store or that took the wheat to the manufacturer to make the bread or what it took for the grocery store to run its electricity. You know, he didn't say all these grocery stores, they ought to be dimming their lights. My point is, Joe Biden has done more to create the inflation. Food companies are trying to survive. Their, their margins are tiny. I, I, I know you may think that they're all just rolling over in it, but most grocery stores operate on about a 3 to 4% uh, percentage of, of uh, profit. That's it. So any, anything that gets into that starts making it so it's hard for them Keep the doors open. And I don't know if you've noticed, but in places like California, a lot of those places have closed because their profit margin, low as it is, 3 or 4%, is now less than what it's costing from theft where people come in and rip them off and shoplift. And people that are put in prosecutor's offices by George Soros and other left-wing Democrats, they don't prosecute these people who are shoplifting, so people make more efforts at shoplifting. And the result, companies say, we can't afford to stay in business. And they close the stores. Who gets hurt? Does Joe Biden? No, he still gets his ice cream. It's the people in the poorest neighborhoods in America whose stores close. They're the ones who are ultimately punished because of these stupid policies where nobody is uh, arrested and jailed in consequence for their crimes. So I don't know, again, whose idea this was, but it's just bizarre that he's sitting there pretending that the greatest problem that Americans face 
is that there's one less Oreo in the cookie package this week than there was last week. Do I wish the Oreo company would put more Oreos in the package? Of course I do. Do I wish that the ice cream companies would put more ounces of ice cream in the carton? Of course I do. But what I really wish is we could get rid of Joe Biden and get somebody in the White House who understands the fundamentals of business and economics. Clearly, he does not. Otherwise, how do I feel? Speaking of how I feel, I, I found myself kind of bouncing back between rage and uh, hilarity. What's going on in Georgia this week with the trial involving Fannie Willis and her boyfriend, Nathan Wade? Oh, I said boyfriend. He's also her associate. He is the lead counsel in the trial uh, against Donald Trump and some of the Trump supporters. Now, Fannie Willis is so proud of herself for having indicted Donald Trump, and she's out to get him, and she said so repeatedly. This is her goal. This is her life's call. She even said when she was running for the office of prosecutor that what she was going to be was different because her predecessor was accused of having sex with employees in the office. She wouldn't be doing that. Nope. She's going to be better than that. Um, anyway, I, I want to get to what's been going on. Uh, she explodes on the witness stand when she's asked about her relationship that went beyond, uh, let's just say, colluding and talking about the case. You see, she and Nathan Wade have taken trips together to the Bahamas, to Belize, to Aruba, all over the world. They've had some wonderful times. She's paying him $700,000 a year. He's never tried a case in his life. But I guess with that kind of money, heck, I'll try a case. Anyway, so on the stand, she doesn't like it when people are asking her questions. Let's watch. Give me the time period. That Mr. Talking. Wade visits you at the place you laid your head. When? Has he ever visited you at the place you laid your head? So let's be clear, because you lied in this, this. Let me tell you which one you lied in. Right here? I think you lied right here. No, 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 no. This is the truth, Judge. And this it, is, it, it is a lie. It is gonna, a lie. Right, Ms. Willis? You see. Mr. Sena, I thank you. We're going to take five minutes. Thanks. Do back in five. It's like a scene out of Perry Mason, if you're old enough to remember the old Perry Mason uh, television programs where the witness would get so flustered they just start going ape. Here's what's interesting. This is a prosecutor. This is an attorney who's supposed to be skilled in the courtroom. She violates every single thing that a witness is supposed to do on the stand. Gets so flustered the judge says, let's call a five-minute break. I want you to see Nathan Wade. Uh, he's put on the spot by the attorneys for the other side. And uh, mm. when he's asked a question, let's just say, I don't know if it's a brain freeze or if he's trying to say, how do I lie my way out of this one? You decide. Did you go to a cabin with Miss Willis ever? Ever? Ever. No. You've never gone to a cabinet No. It takes him 30 seconds to decide that, no, he didn't lie. Never been to a cabin with her. It's a cabin. It's pretty simple. You either did or you didn't. Why did it take you that long to figure that out? Unbelievable. Uh, here's another one of the explosive moments in this whole trial this week. When asked about was he reimbursed when he bought these vacations for he and Fannie Willis to go traveling. He said, yes, I was reimbursed. Well, do you have any receipts? Watch the answer. This is classic. All I needed. Um, you said in the affidavit that you roughly shared travel, though, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So this roughly sharing travel, you're saying she reimbursed you? She did. And where did you deposit the money she reimbursed you? Oh, it was cash. She didn't, she didn't give me any checks. So she paid you cash for her share of all these vacations? Mr. Schaefer, you'll step out if you do that again. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so all of the vacations that she took, she paid you cash for? Yes, ma'am. And you purchased all of these vacations on your business credit card, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you included those in deductions on your taxes, correct? No, ma'am. No, you did not. See, that was a very, very revealing question because she asked, okay, so you get all this money back in cash. 
you put it on your business credit card, you reported this to the IRS. No, no, I didn't. Why does that matter? Because if he's using business expenses for personal benefit, um, that's a tax issue. And it can be a pretty big one, especially when we're talking about tens of thousands multiple times over to take these exotic vacations to uh, wonderful places in the Caribbean. So he may have a bigger problem than just sitting there and the embarrassment of all this. There are some true legal issues involved. Was this public money? Was this private money? And if it was public money, how can he justify using it for vacations? Well, the truth is he can't. If it was private money and he's giving it away, was it a gift to Fannie Willis? If it was, she's got to pay uh, for the benefit of that. In taxes, she has to report that as income. Now, if she gave it back to him in the way of cash, he's got to account for it. It's a mess, a total mess. I mentioned a little bit of before that when she was running for election to be the prosecutor, she had some pretty stiff criteria for what a prosecutor should do. Let's see if she lived up to her own criteria. This is from 2020. Because they deserve a DA that won't have sex with his employees. Because they deserve a DA that won't put money in their own pocket when it should go to benefit children. Because we deserve better. You know what? I think she just disqualified herself from uh, serving another day in office in Georgia. Maybe she will resign and say, yeah, I didn't live up to my own standards. You think that'll happen? You're kidding. Of course, it's not going to happen. Absolutely not. Another big story of the week. Uh, we continue to monitor the cognitive dissonance of Joe Biden. Uh, it's interesting now that the mainstream press thought they'd never get there, but they're finally beginning to ask their own questions. And they don't have to turn to, quote, right-wing media to even come up with them. They're seeing it before them. And it's very uncomfortable. Um, there's a lot of things that we've been watching. I want to show you, this kind of puts it in motion. You know, when something is so obvious that you can't ignore it, but there's people who tell you that it's not really happening? Corrine Jean-Pierre reminds us all of that moment in The Naked Gun when Leslie Nielsen tells us there's nothing to see. I mean, that is as accurate as, as it could possibly be. Corrine Jean-Pierre at the White House podium telling us, with explosions going off everywhere, indicating Joe Biden is in la-la land, nothing to see here. Everything is perfectly normal. Let's see. Here's a clip from his actual news conference. You tell me if this is normal. Thank you. Take some questions. President Biden, something the special counsel said in his report is that one of the reasons you were not charged is because... In his description, you are a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. I'm well-meaning, and I'm an elderly man, and I know what the hell I'm doing. I've been president, and I put this country back on its feet. I don't need his recommendation. It's How totally bad out. is your memory, and can you continue as president? My memory is so bad, I let you speak. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's what your I'm, memory has gotten worse, Mr. No, president? No, my memory is not good. My memory is fine. My memory, take a look at what I've done since I've become president. That may be the worst thing he could ever say. Because he said before, just watch me. Okay, we have. And it's frightening. He says here, take a look at my work. Hmm, we have. And it's absolutely terrifying. So maybe he shouldn't invite us to look at his work. Because when we do, it's not good. Um, Kareem Jean-Pierre. I love the uh, nickname. I love to give credit to Dan Mandis, local talk show host. He calls her Corringe Jean-Pierre. And uh, she's asked, will he take a cognitive test? Every other president for, I think, the last 18 presidents has taken one. Here's her answer. He shows it every day on how he thinks, how he operates. Uh, and so that is how uh, that is how the Dr. O'Connor sees it. And that's how I'm going to leave it. What do you think about the 
idea of taking that kind of a test. I, mean, I believe, for me, you're asking me my personal opinion, uh, he is sharp. Uh, he is on top of things. He, when we have uh, meetings with him, with his staff, he's constantly pushing us, getting, trying to get more information. And so that has been my experience with this president. Uh, anything else outside of that, uh, I just shared with you what Dr. O'Connor said to me. Uh, and so I'll just leave it there. Mm. Yeah, because uh, she sees something the rest of us don't see. And you say, well, yeah, but she's there. But she's also standing up there and saying, He's the most competent president we've ever had. Then, then we've really been in worse trouble for our entire history than we ever imagined. Uh, the other day, he uh, was an hour late to an event that he called. He sets the schedule. Uh, presidents have things happen, so I'm not going to fault him so much for being an hour late. What I will fault him for, as he goes to the microphone to talk, most people would wait until they're at the lectern and standing before the microphone to begin speaking. He doesn't. He starts talking as he's shuffling toward uh, the event. And then he just walks away, promising he'll get back to us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Before we begin, I'm going to make this statement. Let us stand on the zone. I'm not going to take any questions, but I'll be taking questions tomorrow and the next day. But he didn't take questions tomorrow or the next day. We're still waiting on him. How come? I think his staff is scared to death to put him out there. But I want you to see when he closes his remarks, there's a phrase here that just makes no sense at all. Listen to it. We'll bring it up again. God bless you all. May God protect our speakers. And I promise I'll come back and answer questions later. Thank you. Sir, when Trump said that, sir, what did Putin hear? What's plan B if the speaker doesn't act? Sir, the hostage is going to be very valid. And there he goes gently into the dark night. Now, what we don't understand is when he said, may God protect our speaker. Is he really that concerned about Mike Johnson? I, I'm delighted that he is. He hadn't said a nice word about him since he became speaker. But maybe this is his new attempt to unify us. I don't know. It was totally bizarre. I simply couldn't tell you. All right, let's go to some of your questions. I have a feeling we have a few. Johnny, anybody... Yeah. Timed in today? Yeah, we've got a few questions here. Uh, first off, we've got a super chat from someone going by Stud. Uh, very confident person, apparently. Indeed. Uh, the question is, Mike, why did Trump confuse Nikki Haley with Nancy Pelosi? And will he swap out attorneys with Matt Whitaker? Swap out attorneys with Matt Whitaker? That one I don't understand. I'm not sure. I don't know why he confused. You know, in the course of things, Donald Trump will make some verbal errors. I, I won't defend him when he does, because every now and then he'll say something that I scratch my head and say, what did he say? Be honest with you, I've been at the podium for many, many hours myself over the course of the last 50, 60 years, and I can tell you that I, too, will occasionally, you know, say something, and somebody will say, did you know what you said? And I'll have to be told, because I don't know. But I do think that I have some ability to walk to the podium and walk back from it uh, without having to get directions. And so does Trump. And Trump can speak for an hour and a half without notes and be lucent. So does he make mistakes? He, you bet he does. Sometimes they're costly and embarrassing, but we all do it. What we're talking about here is something that is far more uh, insidious and frightening to us, and that is that Joe Biden seems to be unaware of what's going on around him. That's what we're concerned about. Okay. Now, I've seen the sentiment uh, in a few different places, um, basically can, uh, speculating that that comment by Joe Biden was a threat to Speaker Mike Johnson when he said, uh, God bless Mike jo uh, the Speaker, and then he shuffled off oh. after that one clip. What do you think about that? Um, I think it was just a, a, a miss, yeah, just something that he, kind of burped out. He's, I don't think he's too any. senile to give that kind of a veiled threat. I, I can't imagine it. And it wasn't a very good veiled threat to say, may God protect our speaker. I'm thinking, okay, I hope he does. <laughs> good, for, good for you. Nice of you to say it. Guess we're in agreement on something. Um, all right, got a question from Purple Haze. Uh, do you think if Biden is as competent and sharp as he declares he is, should he, um, should he say to the council, her, put me on the stand so I can prove to the American people that I'm capable to run? Well, that'd be great. I'll tell you what would be simpler 
just released the full transcript of the Robert Hur interview with Joe Biden. One of the things that's already come out, and by the way, it was interesting that it was uh, NBC that reported this, not Fox News or one of the right wing media. Uh, but NBC reported that Joe Biden, who got all upset when they, uh, the report came out that he could not remember the date of his son Bo's death, and he got very angry about that at the press conference and said, with some expletives, that of course he could remember. How dare them say that? Well, as it turns out, NBC, no, again, no friend of Trump and never an enemy of Biden, NBC said that it wasn't Robert Hur who brought that up. It was Joe Biden who brought that up. And Joe Biden couldn't remember the year in which his son died in the course of that interview. So Joe Biden made it sound like Robert Hur brought it up. That's not what happened, at least according to witnesses who were there. Here's what he should do. Release the full transcript. The White House should insist on it because if he is as coherent and as clear-headed as he claims to be, then this transcript will absolutely affirm that. And it will also be a great answer to, to when Robert Hur said, we're not going to put him on trial, not because he didn't take documents, because he did, not because those documents were top secret, which they were, not because those documents had any business being in Joe's possession, which they didn't, and not because he didn't share them with others, which he did. No, we're not going to prosecute him because we'd never get a jury to convict an elderly man with a terrible memory and who seems frail and unable to answer questions. So if that's not who Robert Hur saw, let the rest of us see. Publish the transcript in its entirety. Be Joe's best defense. It would be the best weapon against those who accuse him of not being capable. Okay. All right, got a good question here from Michael L. With another loss in New York in the RNC chair leaving, who should leave, lead Excuse me, the RNC? I, I don't have a candidate personally. I know Donald Trump has... Uh, um, recommended Michael uh, Waitley out of North Carolina. And I don't know him personally. Uh, I know of him, and I hear he's a good guy. I couldn't attest whether he's the best or not. But I will uh, say that if Donald Trump is the presumptive nominee of the party, and that's who he thinks would be our best shot, I'm okay with that. Uh, the party chairman is an important position. But, you know, I, I, one thing I want to make clear you cannot blame Donald Trump that people lose elections in some of these places. He's endorsing people that I didn't think he should have endorsed. Maybe that was the reason some of them lost elections that maybe we could have won. I don't know. But he didn't lose the election. Can't blame him. Candidates win, candidates lose. You don't blame consultants. I'm saying this as a person who's been a candidate many times. Ultimately, it's on you, the candidate, to win or to lose. A lot of factors go into that. Um, but the New York race, it was disappointing. Here's my question. Why did the Republicans feel so obligated to get rid of George Santos before the election in the first place? Democrats don't do that. They keep Cori Bush in office, even after she's spending tens of thousands of dollars on private security and is rooting for Hamas to defeat Israel. You got Ilhan Omar, who says that she's really there to help Somalia. How come she didn't get thrown out? I mean, I could go through a list. But Democrats protect the people in their party who do stupid things. We throw ours out. And then we have a razor slim margin. And look, Santos was an embarrassment to say the least. And I'm glad the Republicans, I, I say I'm glad, they should have allowed it to play out in some level of due process. But here's the problem. The person who won that race had been the congressman for that district for many years. He left that office to go run for governor. He got defeated. So he comes back. He's a well-known entity. The person that he defeats, the Republican, not well-known, never run for office before. You can't hardly say that somehow uh, that that was the fault of the RNC chairman. It just can't be. Let's take one more and then we're going to go and get some uh, great videos we got. Okay. I uh, got a pretty good point slash question here from Kent Wellman. Uh, my question is, if Biden's memory is so sharp, then during his interview with the special counsel, did he lie to her? That's a great question. And it's, I think it's one that maybe even a few responsible journalists are beginning to ask themselves. Um, what did he say to them? It's all the more reason. Release that transcript. Let us let us see. Um, 
because if he's as sharp as he claims he is, it'll, it'll be revealed in that transcript. We'll see it for exactly what it is. Excellent question, Ken. I want to take a look at, um, uh, well, actually, this, this next one I'm going to skip because we just talked about it. Uh, that was okay. the one where the NBC reporter uh, did raise the whole issue. Right. And so we'll just pass by it. But if you want to know, what does the Biden's presidency kind of look like right now? Well, maybe this little clip from history will show you it looks a lot like this. As you see, this is the Hindenburg. It did not end well as it went down in flames over New Jersey about 100 years ago. Not a good look, but sometimes you see that and you're thinking, yeah, it's sort of like uh, the Biden presidency right now. Democrats are hoping that they figure out a way to keep him off the ballot because they're scared to death um, that if he stays as their candidate with Kamala in the, uh, in the bullpen, they're in real trouble. I would say that if they stay in the game and if God forbid they win, the country is in real trouble. Um, illegal immigration continues to be one of the top issues in our country and well it should be. The uh, border, so-called border bill, which wasn't a border bill, has now failed. I found it interesting that it kept being called a border bill, $120 billion and only 20 billion of it had anything to do with the border. But Corrine Jean-Pierre at the White House podium is asked about something very specific. 20,000, not 20, 20,000 illegal immigrants from China have come across our border. And she's asked, is she worried about that? Here it is. What kind of national security issue is this, given China's hacking of U.S. infrastructure, the uh, spying that they do, and the other aggressions? So, look, we take that very seriously, what's happening at the border. Everybody, uh, we try to uh, make sure that, um, uh, uh, you know, as it, as it relates to um, uh, unlawful, unlawful uh, crossings, uh, we certainly uh, do everything that we can uh, to make sure uh, that, that, uh, uh, that we deal with that. If you took the uh, 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 out of that, it lasted about three seconds. But don't worry, because the key moment there was when she said, they take it seriously. You see the seriousness in all their actions? Boy, I do. I I've never seen a person so completely discombobulated at a microphone as Corrine Jean-Pierre right then, trying to figure out how can she explain away that our country let 20,000 illegal Chinese immigrants in, and we have no idea why they've come. But I'm sure it's only to uh, prepare lo mein for people across the country and introduce us to egg rolls and uh, crab rangoons. Why else would they have come across? I'm sure there's no insidious purpose behind them, and the Communist Chinese Party didn't send them with the idea of being sleeper cells and one day wreaking havoc on our country. By the way, um, some cities are now going to the place where they're asking their local residents to take illegal immigrants into their home because they've run out of space. They've taken up schools. They've taken up community centers. They've taken up bus stations, airports, and every square inch of hotels in major cities like Washington, New York, Chicago. So what's, what's left? Well, some cities are now saying, well, we'd like for our local residents to take in sort of sight unseen, no paperwork on these people, bring them into your home. Um, I'm not sure how well that's going to work, but, you know, here's what I'm realizing. For some liberal families who think this is great, it's working out real well. Let me show you the clip, and I'll explain why it's working out so well. It's a delight, and it's really fun having them. What I realized is there's so much prejudice against refugees, mostly because people don't know them. Lisa says she feels like she has her own personal chef, as Wildande loves cooking. They gusta. I'm sure she does love cooking. Uh... And you know what? The, the host, they love free labor. <laughs> they love having someone there who's going to cook. I'm sure they're going to be given some other assignments. Would you clean? Could you uh, get the, get the, mop the floor over here? And by the way, we need to dust in this room. Now, you could say, well, that's fair enough. I mean, they're getting to live there for free, so shouldn't they do something? Yeah, that's fine. But do you think that these liberal people are bringing these folks into their homes all out of the love of their heart? It might just be because this is free labor. Wow. You know, thought of that. It, it's 
I, I can't quite put my finger on what it reminds me of. You know, having somebody work for you uh, for free, not yeah. paying them at all. I think it's um, <laughs> a s internship. 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 Yeah, that's what, that's it, what is. it is. That's yeah, don't don't go to the other word you were thinking about. We'll get banned no, forever from YouTube. I know you got one more super chat we're going to get to before we close out today. Yes, yeah, got a super chat from Sue Prov, uh, five dollars. Thank you very much, Sue. This uh, her question is, or rather and ask uh, your take on Tucker's interview with Putin. I did not see it. I saw a few clips of it, didn't see the whole thing. Um, you know, I thought it was fine for him to go do it. A lot of people were all upset that he went and had the interview. I don't know why that's a problem. Uh, Putin's a world figure, Tucker's a journalist, so they sit down, they have an interview. You get to make your own conclusions as to whether you were getting honest answers out of Putin and whether Tucker was responsible in the questions he asked. But that's how journalism should operate. Do the interview. Let us see it. Let us make our own conclusions. I, I was a little troubled when Tucker went to a, a supermarket in uh, Moscow and he essentially said, boy, they've got it good here. I've been to Russia. I didn't see it being so good for the people there. So either one of two things. Since I was there, they've made it a magnificently better country than I saw. Or he was taken to a very specific, special place and saw what most Russians don't experience day by day. My attitude was when I got out of there, if I never go back, I'm good. I'm fine. Because it was not a pleasant place to be. Hey, we're glad you joined us today. Be sure to leave your questions in the comments, even if we didn't get to yours today. We'd love to uh, hear from you. And if you enjoyed the show, good time to subscribe right now. Subscribe to the channel. YouTube just won't let people see it unless we get the subscriber number up. So subscribe, be sure to hit the notification bell, hit the like button, and share with others that you will be watching the live streams. We will not have one next week, but we'll be back on March the 8th, which is a Friday for our next live stream with Mike. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. We've got regular episodes of Huckabee that'll be coming to you every week, including the one this weekend. Let's watch. This week on Huckabee, pro-life activist Paul Vaughn on being targeted by the DOJ. Migrating to red states with American refugees author Roger Simon. The timeless comedic style of Bob Strongberg. Brad Wilcox on why you should get married. And country artist Brett Loper lets freedom ring. Watch Huckabee Saturday at 8, 7 central and again on Sunday at 9, 8 central right here on TBN.